neurologically, laughter is the most contagious behavior we have. And, and if you're in a group, it's even more contagious. Like if you're in a room with people, it fires off. Um, there is a bodily biological reaction that happens when we laugh together. Our, our neurons fire together. Um, and it's very hard, even if you're in a bad mood. And I've done this with people when they're in a bad mood. And they don't, they don't, you know, I just want to sulk. I just want to sit here about it. So you know, when you start laughing next to them, they can't help it. They're like, I've literally had somebody say to me once, he's like, he, he was sulking after we had a disagreement. And I was like, are you just going to sit there and sulk? Because I'm not going to let you. And I started laughing. He was, I'm not going to do that laughter joke of bullshit. And after me laughing for about a minute, he literally couldn't help himself and started laughing. <laughs> Welcome to Gratitude Geek, the relationship marketing podcast, helping DIY marketers find your micro influencer magic so you attract raving fans and repeat buyers. I'm your host, Candice Rodardi, and today I'm thrilled to introduce you to Stephanie Paul, an executive leadership coach who specializes in communication. Stephanie is the author of Unlock the Magic of Your Story, a book that teaches how to use neuroscience secrets to engage and influence an audience. Her focus is on storytelling, leadership, communication, and mastermind. Stephanie is all about changing the face of bored, B-O-R-E-D, rooms. Her mm -hmm. book is a masterclass in storytelling wrapped up in captivating and entertaining stories. Through her training, Stephanie believes that the key to powerful commanding leadership and speaking presence is attainable. Join us today as we delve into Stephanie's practical guide and learn how to become a rainmaker, creating influential visions and driving emotional storms through the hearts and minds of any audience you communicate with. Mm -hmm. Stephanie's dynamic and fresh approach is proven science-based techniques and skills is easily learned and highly effective. So sit back, relax, and let's unlock the magic of storytelling with Stephanie Paul. Woo! I'm thrilled to be here. <laughs> you welcome, made me welcome, sound welcome. <laughs> Gratitude Geek is sponsored by HoneyBook. HoneyBook is the leading client platform for independent businesses. It lets us manage our workflow and client experience, streamlining all the steps it takes to sell and deliver personalized services. By combining tools like billing, contracts, and client communication, HoneyBook helps independents like you and me get organized and provide top-tier service at every step. I couldn't run my podcast nor my coaching business without HoneyBook. You can get started with 35% off your first year when you visit momgeek.com forward slash HoneyBook. Membership options are flexible, and this amazing promotion applies whether you pay monthly or annually. Go to momgeek.com forward slash HoneyBook for 35% off your first year. That's momgeek.com forward slash HoneyBook. So tell us your story. How'd you get to where you are today? Oh gosh. Um, well, I was born. No, <laughs> let's not start there. I had spent a couple of decades working in eight different international markets in the entertainment industry. And um, I was married and uh, I wanted out of my marriage and I wanted out of Hollywood, so to speak. Um, and I moved um, away from both to a small town at the bottom of Orange County called San Clemente at the beach and uh, tried to figure out what I was going to do next. Um, when I was teaching an acting class, uh, believe it or not, um, and when I say moved away from the entertainment industry, I did everything in the entertainment industry except for sound. So if I wasn't on stage as a performer, as an actress or a stand-up comedian, I was backstage doing something and I produced and directed and um, I was an agent for a couple of years. And the only thing that I yeah didn't do was sound. Um, and I also produced events and all that kind of stuff. So um, I was teaching a small acting class in a tiny little theatre in San Juan Capistrano, and one of my uh, students was a professor at Chapman University, and he said, "You know what? You should take your skill set into the corporate world." <laughs> I was like, well, "You got you're nuts! Like that's not going to happen." Um, and he's like, "No, seriously." And I was like, "Okay." Uh, and the local newspaper did an article on me because I play the president of the United States in two sci-fi co comedies, um, and. They thought that was cool because of the whole Nixon thing in San Clemente. And uh, I got my first two clients. They approached me and said, hey, can you help me with this? And then so I was like, maybe there's something here. Maybe I could I could have a business. And I've always been a coach in some way, shape or form. Whatever I've done, I've always coached it or taught it or something. And um, both my teachers were, uh, I mean, both my parents, sorry, were teachers. My uh, dad was a professor at university night school. Um, he also had a, a career in accounting. And then... Uh, 
Um, my mother was a primary school teacher before she, uh, you know, started a family. And then after her family went back to work. Um, so it's all in my blood. And um, I knew that if I was going to start a corporate business, I had to learn some stuff. So I got some, got a business coach. I got some mentors. I got involved in um, some peer groups and things like that. And someone said, you know, you need to sort of go into a niche market. Like, you know, you can't just target everybody. And I'm like, well, everybody communicates. Why not? Everybody should be good at storytelling. Why not? But, you know, um, so through a series of events, I ended up um, being involved in TED Talks for about four years and coached about 70 odd people in that format. And then I produced TEDx Mission Viejo myself just to prove to everybody that I wasn't a speaking coach. I was a producer. Um, everyone thought I was crazy because of the, how insane I did it. Like for a hundred people, I did this insane, insane conference. Like it was what TED talks when I mean, we had artists and um, we had uh, artists and 14 different speakers and we had a band and we had like balloons everywhere the local balloon company like built a whole tunnel of balloons as you went into res you know reception it was insane we had a piano player with candles on a baby grand like it was nuts and so I ended up being introduced to biotechnology and technology um, industries and helped a lot of startups raise money um, and you know it it wasn't necessarily the slide deck and all that kind of stuff. And I've since written an article for Life, Sci uh, Life Sciences Leader, which is one of the big uh, publications, where um, when you pitch to raise money or pitch in sales or anything like that, um, it's not the deck and it's not the data and it's not the science that gets you the sale. It's um, the engagement and the storytelling and the emotions because we cannot make a decision without a buy-in from our limbic system it's simply biologically impossible so your logic and reason will tell you everything you think you know but and, and if you don't get the emotional buy-in it just won't happen so I knew that that industry would not necessarily listen to me as an expert if they thought that I came from the yeah. entertainment world right so I had to go down the rabbit hole of understanding the science, the neuroscience and the biology as to why storytelling actually works. And I became a certified laughter yoga trainer and uh, I spent four years in the laughter yoga community, <laughs> um, which is pretty crazy, but uh, uh, you know, awfully fun. And, um, and then really started to understand why story worked um, so well through um, our brains and stuff. So um, at the end of the day, it's all about business is about building rapport and relationships and the better storyteller you can be um, and the more humorous you can be, the easier you engage the limbic system and are successful with yourself. Let's talk about TED Talks. Okay. I'm very interested in TED Talks. What does it okay. take to be a TEDx speaker? Well, that's really interesting. Um, uh, I have spoken to my mentors many times about this and they're, 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 super connected to the actual TED community, like the TED owners and TED people and that kind of stuff. Um, if you think about a TED talk, if it's curated correctly or a TEDx, um, it's kind of like putting a movie together. Uh, there's usually a theme. So there's the movie. It's a horror, you know, let's say. Um, and what goes into a horror, you have cornerstone characters or whatever that I'm is. I'm sorry. I'm trying to imagine a horror, a horror film TEDx <laughs> and you could totally go with that theme. <laughs> oh, sorry. I didn't have to no, but it's, it's go it's, on. No, it's just try and get people to understand how a, a TED event is actually curated. So there's always a theme and we're going to choose horror and I'm correlating it with creating a movie. So, you know, the writer creates characters and, and the characters have, you know, problems and challenges and all that kind of stuff that they have to deal with it throughout the movie. Cause we've all seen movies and we've all, well, most people have seen TED talks. Um, and so you, you need different characters, right? You can't have all the same characters. So when you create a TED or a TEDx, you have to figure out, okay, who's my cornerstone thing that goes into the theme. So is it the antagonist or is it, you know, whatever. So like, like a horror, you know, so the horror would be whatever's killing everybody, you know, or something like that. Um, and then from there, you sort of create your characters and their life and what that's going to happen. So the same thing sort of happens with curating a TED or a TEDx event. You, I mean, when I did mine, for example, um, my topic or theme was perception. 
And I wanted the Orange County community to change their perception on how they saw stuff. So our, our logo was two people with two magnifying glasses looking at each other in, in a circle, you know. Um, and I wanted to change the perception around things that they thought were everyday life or things that they had no idea that was going on in their community. For example, um, my cornerstone speaker was a young lady who had been trafficked um, from the age of 11 until she was 16. And a lot of people had no idea that human trafficking goes on prevalently in Orange County. And I was I wanted people to understand that this woman exists in our community and it exists in our community and it's a problem. Um, and we had uh, an engineer, we had a neuroscientist come and speak. We had an organization, where a group of children who were from different religions that came together and sang and made music together. So, you know, um, uh, that was just beautiful, you know, Christian, Mormon, Hindu, like whatever. They, it was, it was a great remember, book. Do you remember the name of the group? Um, you could go to tedxmissionbieho.com and All see. Right. The I will look speakers. it up. I, yeah, and there'll um, be a link in the show notes because that to me sounds really cool. Yeah, that, that was super cool. So as you can tell, there were lots of different players within the theme. Um, and so you kind of have to be at the right place at the right time. You know, if you hear actors get interviewed and they're like, yeah, you know, I was just in that time in my life and that's how I got that character in that movie. It's kind of the similar thing with Ted. Like you, you, you can't force yourself on the curator and on the producers and stuff because they're looking for a very specific thing and you have to fall into that very specific category. So, um, and under the Ted rules, you cannot produce your own event so you can be a speaker. <laughs> you cannot have, um, uh, uh, what do you call it? Um, people that give you money. <laughs> it's going out of my head. You cannot have a sponsor as a speaker, you know? So it, it, it's, it has to be integrity driven and it cannot be for the sake of just getting yourself a TED talk. So um, it's, 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 it's an interesting question because it's, it's not as easy as everybody thinks. So everybody comes up, I'm going to have this TED talk and it's going to be great. And, but you got to be at the right place at the right time. Okay. So I actually, that was a selfish question. I have a couple of clients that want to speak on a TEDx stage. So what I'm hearing from you is they need to find the stage that has the theme around their message and that's who mm -hmm. they need to pitch. Is that what mm -hmm. I'm hearing? Mm -hmm. Okay. Or they change their message, their message to pitch the theme. All right. That changes everything for somebody whose aspiration is to be a TEDx speaker, because mm -hmm. it's not about what you want. It's what the audience is looking for, mm -hmm. which is, you know, that's, you could argue that that's what happens in a movie too. You're, you want to make a movie, but sometimes you can't make the movie about the way you can't make the movie go in the direction you want to go, which is one of those things that, do you, uh, there was a book that my sisters and I all read, and then we went and saw the movie together. And it was about two sisters, and one of them died. And in the um, in the movie, the wrong sister died. Oh, like they the movie killed they off screwed the, it up. The this the movie killed off the wrong sister. They didn't kill off the sister that died, right? That's hysterical, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah. Is and we were when we left the theater, we were just so disappointed and it wasn't the story yeah it wasn't the story that we had gone to see but it was probably the story that audiences who hadn't read the book uh, would have wanted to see but i bet you felt like you know like yeah sort of changed we totally. we did we did yes, it yes. was it was not the movie we were looking for so here's an interesting thing you just brought up. It's never about you. It's always about the audience. Mm -hmm. It's always what's in it for them. And it's always about connecting to their needs. And, you know, when I was doing stand-up comedy, what I learned very quickly is the audience will tell you where they want to go. Mm -hmm. They won't listen to your jokes if they're not interested in your jokes. So you mm -hmm. better have more jokes packed in your pocket so that you can change gears pretty quickly. And it's the same when you're speaking in the sales conversation. It's the same when you're telling a story um, to a group of people that want to, you know, I mean, you you have to learn human behavior. You have to learn to read your audience and, mm -hmm. and hear the, them speaking to you, even without language, if that makes sense. That's why I hate the concept of doing courses. I do not want to do pre-recorded courses. People said, Candice, you need to do courses. You'll make more money if you do courses. And I'm like, no, mm -mm. Mm -hmm. I do live interactive workshops with a live audience. And that's what works for me. That's, mm -hmm. that's my truth. You know, 
it might mm-hmm. work for other people the other way, but my truth is I want to do live interactive courses. All right. So let's talk about this uh, limbic system. Could you explain mm-hmm. what that is for the layman? Okay. So um, if this is a great way to look at it. So if this is my hand, pretend it's my brain, right? So this is now, and this is my neck, right? So um, all messages that come into our body come through our sen- senses, right? Touch, taste. Audible. Stephanie is making a fist. Oh, FYI. sorry, sorry yeah. I forgot. We're, oh, this is not on the right. <laughs> Silly me. I so if, if you make a fist, if, if you're listening, audience members, let's get interactive. Make a fist with your hand, okay? And touch touch the, the what would you call this, the crevice of your wrist with your finger. Let's pretend that's the neck, the base of the neck where the spine goes into the head. And that is essentially where your um, reptilian brain starts and it goes up into about, before you get to where your fingers are crunched up in your fist. Um, And then your limbic system is wrapped around that. Okay, and that's um, your mammalian brain. So it's exactly what an animal has in its head. And a, a reptilian brain is exactly what a reptile has in its head. And then around that is wrapped your neocortex. And that's only about 200,000 years old. And that's where logic and reason and language is created. Now, any form of message before it gets to your language, logic and reason has to go through your reptile brain. And if your reptile brain is okay with it, it will send it up to your limbic system. And then the limbic system, if it's okay with it, will send it up to the neocortex. That's a very, very basic way of explaining it. Um, It's a little more complicated, but let's just not go there. Um, And so when when, uh, you get to your logic and reason um, and language areas of the brain, um, it always has to go back and ask the limbic system, hey, you know, how do you feel about this? Which is why story is so good, because the story tickles the limbic system and tantalizes the limbic system and makes the limbic system feel. Because the limbic system, regardless of what you're saying, what, what if you're not congruent with what you're saying, the limbic system will read it and then you'll have a gut instinct that goes, mm, I don't feel good about this kind of thing. Because the limbic system, without you even realizing reads over 4,000 different human behaviors very quickly. And it can it can even see micro expressions um, because that's keeping your biological body safe, right? So we assess, um, we can feel comfortable or um, discomfort, but we're always assessing risk. So that's why it's much easier for our brains to stay with things that we know versus things we don't know because it, it, it's less risky, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's good for us. It's just less risky. Um, So especially in sales, you've got to make that limbic system feel less risky, feel super comfortable, feel warm and fuzzy, feel excited, feel novelty, feel, you know, all those kind of things. Um, And then the limbic system will tell the neocortex, okay, cool, let's buy this. All mammals have a limbic system Mm -hmm. and only the higher mammals have the neocortex. Well, that's us. Yeah, because we have language. So, um, so chimpanzees and gorillas don't have. A... I don't. I don't want to go there because I'm not that. Like you know, I haven't okay. studied okay. all the brains. I've I mean, just seen. I just seen some some uh, higher mammal reasoning that is, like raccoons can figure shit out. You know. <laughs> oh no! Yeah, I'm, I'm not. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that they don't have mobility skills because mo- mobility yeah. and things like that are very different. But, um, I meant with you, reason. Could, yeah, yeah. No, with reason. I mean, like. They can probably learn things, but you know, like I said, I'm not a new, I'm not a new yeah. scientist. I've just studied as much as I have studied. Um, they can probably learn things, but they do things based on emotion and fight or flight and uh, their biology yeah. and their instinct. Does that make sense? Yes. So you and you can't tell me that animals don't feel emotion. Oh no, they're a hundred percent emotional. They, they totally mm-hmm. feel emotion. Mm-hmm. I have a cat that pouts. Mm-hmm. He is a pouter, and mm-hmm. he lets us know when he's not happy. Yeah, yes. very emotional. So, so wow. Okay, so speaking of emotion, let's talk. Let, let's shift gears now that we know about the <laughs> limbic system. Because I, you have, you said so many things, and I have so many questions. Let's talk about laughing yoga. Ooh. I've never done it, but it just sounds like so much fun. I, I actually, I don't do. I, I should join another yoga class. But I used to love yoga, and sometimes it's hilarious because you get yourself into these positions, and there, it's just <laughs> hilarious because you know you look ridiculous. <laughs> So, so talk to me about laughing yoga. Where, what's the background story and why is it um, beneficial and what convinced me to take a class? Okay. So um, La- laughter yoga was started by uh, in Mumbai, India, I believe in 1991 by Dr. Kataria. Um, 
he was doing a thesis or a, an ethereal um, paper on laughter and the effects of laughter. Um, he went into the park one day where apparently hundreds of people walk in the park in, in Mumbai, India. Um, then he gathered a group of his friends and he said, you know, let, let's try this laughter thing. And they started off with, um, with telling jokes. And by the end of the first week, some people were getting offended by some of the jokes. So um, he decided that some of the, jo the joking kind of uh, idea of it was not so great. And he went home to it and discussed it with his wife. And she was a yoga instructor. And she said, why don't you just try pranayama with laughter? Um, which yoga essentially is breathing, right? Pranayama. And, um, and he goes, okay. So he came up with some crazy exercises like drinking the milkshake, <laughs> you know, and you audience can't see me, but I had a pretend milkshake in my hand and, you know, put my head back like I was drinking it, you know, or, this, or talking on the pretend, you know, cell phone. <laughs> um, so it's just, just dumb stuff. But um, it, there's like 11 different hormones that you release when you laugh um, for a period of time. The longest session I've ever had is like 10 minutes and my stomach was so painful. It was like I'd done a million sit-ups the next day, like I could barely move. Um, we release things like um, oxytocin, serotonin, dopamine, um, all kinds of like amazing chemicals that make us feel good. My best um, description of it is if you want to try this and you've never done it before and you don't know how to even approach it, is if you have a partner or a friend or even an animal, um, grab, you know, hug them. I, uh, and I did this exercise with a woman. She's like, I, I don't know about this. You know, I just want to, uh, and I said, well, will you give me a minute of your time and, and can I touch you? And she's like, okay, sure. And we had somebody else in the room that timed the minute. So you could do this on your phone or your watch. And um, I, and I hugged her and we both lay our heads on each other's shoulders and the timer went off and we laughed for a minute straight. But prior to us starting the exercise, I said to her, just check in with your body. How do you feel? You know, you're tired, are you achy? Are you sore anywhere? Like, you know, how do you just check in with your body? How do you feel? She says, okay. And then we did the exercise. And then after we finished the minute, I said to her, how do you feel now? And she goes, euphoric. I feel like I'm high. And I said, that's exactly what laughter does for you. And um, it's it truly is really good medicine. I've heard some miracle stories in the laughter yoga community about people be healing themselves by doing laughter yoga. So I totally believe that. I So I'm living with metastatic breast cancer. And at the very beginning of my journey, nine years ago, I was given, or however many years it's been. Yeah, I think it's been nine years. I was given a whole bunch of books and there's this one called Radical Remission. And I believe there's a chapter in radical i may be wrong so please forgive me if i'm wrong on this it may have been in a different book that talks about watching funny movies as mm -hmm. a as an alternative you know it, it's the book what radical remission is not don't do modern don't do western medicine it's in addition to western medicine try all these things too right and uh, which is why i liked that book so much because all the other books that people were giving me were like you can heal yourself Chris cured cancer. Chris did not cure cancer. He had Western medicine take care of this cancer first. So just saying, don't tell mm -hmm. me to go to Chris killed cancer's website or cured cancer's website. Okay. So anyway, long story short, there was a whole chapter about laughter in that book. If I'm remembering correctly, I could be wrong. It's been nine years, um, but I just totally believed it. So I watched funny movies and it's nine years later and I'm still living with metastatic <laughs> breast cancer. I'm not dead. <laughs> so I'm a fan. I'm a fan of using laughter. I think it's true. And you just do, you just feel different when, after you're done laughing. Um, there's a book. The first study around that um, was done by Norman Cousins. Uh, and he wrote a book about it called Autonomy of an Illness. Um, and he, one of the things he did, he was told, basically was told he was going to die. Um, he checked himself out of the hospital. He checked himself into a hotel. He took ridiculous amounts of vitamin C. He laughed for you know, hours and hours. One of his friends gave him a whole bunch of reels of comedy shows and things like that. And he laughed for hours and hours. And three months later, he checked himself out of the hotel and he was healthy again. So the, the, the whole book is, is actually the first study around laughter and somebody using laughter as a healing mechanism. There's actually a chapter in my book on laughter, but it's it's more about engaging your audience. Um, but it does, it, there's a whole chapter. I think chapter number five is my laughter chapter. Um, but, it, you know, it's... It, there's, there's some crazy, crazy information around like even in Victorian times, how 
um, it was marketed that laughter was dangerous and it could make your children's teeth fall out if they laugh too much, which was acidite. Um, but some of the stuff that I learned when I went through my training, um, so somewhere in there, you know, somebody decided that you can't be serious, that you have to be serious, you can't have fun. And children start laughing at about the age of two months old and there's there's um, nothing, they're not taught laughter, it's innately built into our body. Talking about chimpanzees, there is research around um, animals and their laughter. Um, it's it's essentially uh, panting. <laughs> you know, the, the animal pant is the animal laughter. Um, and they believe, there's, there's more research getting a little bit closer okay. to it, but they believe laughter comes from the limbic system, which is the mammalian brain. So um, that's still not 100% concrete, but I recently read something that, you know, that has, there's research that proves that that's the case. So, or could be the case or very close okay. to the case. All right. Well, let's talk about storytelling in your book. So how do you, when you're telling a story, how do you read the audience to make them laugh? <laughs> <laughs> oh, is that um, a hard question? <laughs> no, it's it's not a hard question. It's just, there's a different way. There are many different ways I can approach the answer. Um so I was actually asked once uh, by an audience, I had an audience of CEOs and I'd been asked to speak to them about um, um, scripting and why scripting was so important. And one of them asked me sort of at the end of my presentation, when we got to Q&A, um, you know, how can you change the energy of the audience and, and, um, and bring that energy up and make them essentially laugh? And I had been taught, believe it or not, by a stand-up comedian, whom which I communicated with last night and I gave his advice back to him last night in a text message. Um, this is a true story. And he came back and said, that's really good advice. And I said, I was like, I didn't say politely, but I was like, don't ask. You gave me that. The, one of the first is it, um, open mics we did together, you gave me that advice. <laughs> he goes, did I? It's like, I totally forgot about it. So his advice was, and this is what I did with this gentleman, um, was, uh, just to look at, just to stare at the audience. Now I up the ante a little bit by um, when he asked me the question, how can you raise the energy and, and make people laugh? And I said, okay, it's really simple. Watch this. And I literally looked at people in the audience one at a time and smiled at them. Just, I've got a crazy smile on my face right now that your audience can't see, but did this crazy smile with my eyes really wide open and just looked around the room and people just looked back and started laughing and smiling at me. And, um, you're making me laugh and I <laughs> <laughs> neurologically laughter is the most contagious behavior we have and and if you're in a group it's even more contagious like if you're in a room with people it fires off um there is a bodily biological reaction that happens when we laugh together our our neurons fire together um and it's very hard even if you're in a bad mood and I've done this with people when they're in a bad mood and they don't, they don't, you know, I just want to sulk. I just want to sit here and bother them. You know, when you start laughing next to them, they can't help it. They're like, I've literally had somebody say to me once, he's like, he, he was sulking after we had a disagreement. And I was like, are you just going to sit there and sulk? Because I'm not going to let you. And I started laughing. He was I'm not going to do that laughter joke of bullshit. And after me laughing for about a minute, he literally couldn't help himself and started laughing. <laughs> oh, that's funny. When I was in high school, I had two friends, Mary and Sharon. And if I send them, if I take out the clip and I send this to them, they're going to remember this moment exactly. We were at Mary's house and we were in her closet. I don't know why we were in the closet and I don't know what happened, but we could not stop laughing. I don't remember why we were laughing. I just remember the three of us were laughing so hard. We had tears running down our faces and we could not stop laughing. No idea what was so funny. No idea why we were all in the closet together. The door was open. It's not like we were in the closet, you know. We were the door, you know, the door of the closet was open, but with you know, some of us were in, some of us out, and we just laughed hysterically. And that moment, I have no idea why we were doing it. I don't know what happened afterwards. I don't remember why we were at Mary's dad's house. I don't remember any of that. I just remember that moment being so important, you know, and so profound, even mm -hmm. though none of the other important details about that moment matter. And that is a super, super key component because people don't make decisions based on what they remember, uh, on what they forget. They make decisions based on what they remember. People, and this is a Maya Angelou quote, people won't remember what you said or what you did, but they will always remember the way you make them feel, right? Mm -hmm. So that's why the limbic system is so incredibly important with any kind of messaging, storytelling, or you know, just sales, 
is surely you got to get the feeling. You got to get yeah. the feelings right. You know, yeah. and we have mirror neurons, and I talk about this in um in my book. It's not just about laughter and things like that. We we shape shift with the energy that's with us. So if somebody's a Debbie Downer, they and they're they're the strongest energy in the room. They bring everybody down. Mm-hmm. If somebody's like super, you know, we gravitate towards people who are high energy and fun and gregarious and great storytellers and just make us feel warm and fuzzy. Yeah. You don't always remember the conversations you have with your friends, but you always remember the friends that make you feel great. Oh, I yeah. want to hang out with Bob because Bob makes me feel awesome every time I see him. Oh my God, my husband and I just had that conversation last night. He was mm-hmm. remembering a couple of his friends from high school and how he just had more fun with the other with one of them. Mm-hmm. Like one of them was more fun to be around. It was how interesting. How mm-hmm. interesting. When I was in sales, I had a, a goal. I, I was young. I was really young. So I don't know where this came from. Somebody taught it to me, though. I mean, I was too young to have come up with this on my own. <laughs> I had a goal to make somebody laugh every day, that if I had made somebody laugh every day, that I had accomplished my mission. And I was 24, 20, 23, 24 years old. And I was a top salesperson at my company. Mm-hmm. And I was a kid. I was mm-hmm. really young, but it's because I made, I made people feel good. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't, and I, I'm sure somebody taught that to me. I'm sure I didn't come up that on my own. <laughs> my daily mantra is how can I make this more fun? And mm-hmm. fun is one of my values. Like my values are education, authenticity, courage, service, um, fun and love, you know? And um, if you're not having fun, neither is your audience. I mean, if you can make a sales call or something super fun and have it be about that person and not make fun of them, you know, but have somebody laughing and all that kind of stuff. I mean, it makes a massive difference. So, you know, you only need to go to my LinkedIn profile and l- l- read my recommendations. I have like just over 60 recommendations on there. Majority of them say, and I don't, t- I don't write these. These are my clients, you know, mm-hmm. I mean, majority of them say it's really fun to work with her. So, you know, but I, that's part of my value system. And it's like, it's, it, if you're not having fun, it's just, what, why? Yeah. yeah. You know? Well, you and I met at a an online networking event, mm-hmm. and I met two people at that event that I said, oh, I want to have more fun with that person. <laughs> and you were one of them. <laughs> cool. Thank <laughs> you. you. you, you know, so, yeah. And you just have to show up. You have to show up authentic, you know, and show up. Mm-hmm. and show up and have fun. I, mean, I want to, before we, before we move on to the next topic, I want to go back to something you said about feeling sorry for yourself and having a pity party mm-hmm. because it's okay. I believe that it's okay to suck your thumb every once in a while if you need mm-hmm. to do that. And mm-hmm. I will on purpose put on a movie that I know will make me cry mm-hmm. just to get it out of my system mm-hmm. because That's you good. And I once, my husband was mad at me once for being mad about so or I was just in a bad mood and he was mad at me about being mad about something and, and and he he said something to me and I just turned to him and I said I am happy all the time I need this moment right now to not be happy <laughs> did that make you laugh when that statement came out of your mouth you know actually I think it did <laughs> but then he was like okay <laughs> okay but yeah, you know, I guess when when you're around somebody and they're always happy, you're lucky, and then mm-hmm. they're not. <laughs> you, know, like- you know, it comes for me. It comes down to doing the work and truly getting to know and understand yourself. The more you get to know and understand yourself, the better you are to um, build rapport, relationships, and understand others. I mean, I use a bunch of assessments in my work with people, um, and uh, you know, I, I literally remember soon after I moved in with my partner, and he has two children. Um, and so essentially you think about it, there are three family members, right? And then there's me and I'm, I feel like the outsider trying to fit in. And I felt like that with my siblings. I had three older siblings and I was much younger than the rest of them. And he, every time we, after we first moved in, every time we'd have an argument or things would get super uncomfortable for me, I would leave. I would just go for a walk. I would just get out of the house, you know, thinking I was doing good work, stepping away from the negative energy. And one day he said to me, you can't just always leave. And I said, why not? I've been doing it since I was seven years old. And in that moment, I realized, oh, my God, this is a trigger from childhood. Because it was it was literally an impulse response. And the first time I packed my bag and my teddy bear and went off to leave the house, I was seven. And um, because I didn't get the ice cream that I wanted. Uh, so... And I packed my bag and I remember getting my teddy bear and it was like the sun was setting and I walked down the driveway and I sat at the end of the driveway under a tree 
And I realized I had no money and I didn't have any food and I didn't know where I was going to go. So I didn't necessarily have any safety or shelter. So I sort of, you know, hung out there as long as possible, just like an hour. I was, I was stubborn little, and, it just, and I used to lock myself in the wardrobe when people pissed me off. Like I would go into the wardrobe. I had this doll that was the same size as me when I was younger, big sort of huge, like life-size doll. And I'd put her in front of me and I'd hide behind it. And I would be in there for four or five hours. Everyone would be looking for me. And where have you been? And I'd come out, where have you been? But I'm here the whole time. No, you haven't. Where did you go? <laughs> I'm not going to tell you I was hiding in the wardrobe because that was my, when I got pissed off with you space <laughs> as a kid. But, you know, I learned all these things when I moved in with my partner and his kids that a lot of stuff was childhood triggers. And when you learn to let go of some of those things and you realize that there's all these emotions that are stored in us that there are triggers from past trauma, past history, um, you can let go of them and move forward and 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 then see others for who they truly are. You know, I had um I do a woman in leadership mastermind on the third Sunday of every month for um obviously women in leadership. And our guest speaker was Chase Hughes, who's currently listed as the number one human behavior expert in the world, according to Dr. Phil. Um, and he's written a bunch of books on it, and he was in naval intelligence for many years and um he's just super intelligent i mean he created a whole bunch of stuff with the cia and and the you know how they interview people and read behavior and what have you and in the beginning of his book and we talked about it on sunday um is everybody's suffering everybody has experienced some form of trauma you know whether you believe that we're you know we have a soul or we're energy or we're light beings or whatever whatever your belief system is we're not just a meat suit, you know, there is an energy inside us that, 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 that does get affected. Um, and uh, we need to, and he, it was fascinating. He taught us. So, you know, how, when, when animals get hurt, they, they tremor, they shake it off. Like they, they shake for a while. They, you know, you know, fear. And then, and then they sort of just, okay, it's done. And then they go off like nothing happened. Well, we at about the age of three, um, lose the ability to do the tremor thing for whatever reason it's socially unacceptable to shake because you know when you get in a car accident and somebody's like oh my god I can't stop shaking well that's that's the norm but it's only really acceptable to see it when it's something huge but we should learn or relearn to shake off our trauma on a regular basis and there's plenty of stuff online about it um, and my whole group of women in leadership this next month was we're all going to start shaking and trimmering off our trauma <laughs> and we're going to do some of these exercises that we found online who's the, who's the singer taylor taylor swift shake it yeah. off shake it off yeah shake it yeah. just shake it off I, yeah you know what i'm gonna start doing that too yeah there's um <laughs> what is it dr david hold on let me see if i can find it um mm-hmm. uh there, now that song's gonna be in my head i don't even know what the song i only I, all i know is the shake it off part shake it off i love that the tra- um, because you know you the dog gets out of the shower shakes it off gets yeah, on with yeah. it, you know it, that but but yeah I, no, my- naturally yeah it's um it's uh, trauma prevention by dr david bricelli but there's a bunch of video youtubes online that you can find out about it here i put it in your chat you can use it as a link Thank in you. your show notes uh, um, you have been a wealth of links i love it <laughs> <laughs> I, hey, I know a bunch of crazy stuff so we we need to start uh, wrapping up. So let's talk about your gift. Oh yes. Um, so it's it's the twelve um, twelve P's to pitching and presenting, um, and it's a downloadable um, PDF document uh, that I give away for free. Um, and it's it's a powerful gift if you present or pitch and you um, want to sort of prepare yourself because it is a it's a document that helps you prepare for your next pitch or your next presentation or your next sales meeting or whatever that is um and i think it's i go to my website stephaniepaulinc.com forward slash powerful gift for the number four you the letter u um and the link will be in the show notes yeah it's a it's a mini version of my book obviously so awesome (laughs) so it um sounds to me like that might be a good a good uh, freebie for somebody who's in the networking group that needs to figure out how to say their message in 60 seconds. That- um, yeah, it could, it could help with an elevator pitch. Um, it can, it can help in general with uh, just preparing yourself for a sales pitch, you know, or a sales call. 
Um, so, or if you present in any way, shape or form with a slide deck, you know? Mm. Cool. All right. So that link will be in the show notes. I love it. And I love that it's called powerful. Love, love, love that. All right. So what's your uh, favorite? I mean, you, I probably know what the answer is, but I'd love to hear it out of your mouth. What's your favorite marketing tool, tip or technique? Honestly, word of mouth. Mm. I, I love people talking about me. I, I don't like me talking about me. I love um, word of mouth. I, I think your clients and your colleagues are the best people to do the best pitch for you, especially if they're excited about you. If their limbic system is raving about you, uh, it's easy. I mean, I literally had someone, one a client several years ago, and he's actually one of my best referring clients now. Um, he came to, you know, and it was just after my mother died, and I don't know why I was so cocky and confident in the, in the phone call, but I was down in New Zealand, and um, I was coming back to the States, and he, I was on the call with all these executives, and I was going to go and help them raise $50 million, and we ended up raising $53 million, But in the opening of the call, he said, What's the three his- million? Oh, extra three what's, million. Oh no, what's, we, we, what's three million? It's oh, yeah, just what's three million. million. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, but that shows the proof in the pudding. They went above and beyond their goal. And uh he he opened the conversation with me saying, in the history of my career, I have never been referred so strongly to someone as I have been to you. Why are you so special? And I said, because I'm awesome, dude. <laughs> I said, I'm really good at what I do. And that's probably why you got a really strong pitch from somebody that's worked with me. So (laughs) I love that story. I love that story. Wow. Let's talk about being the kind of person that other people talk about like that. I think, you know, it comes back down to integrity. It comes back down to values, having a moral compass and honoring your word. Do and, you know, as you say, um, be in the service of others, especially if you're in some kind of sales. Um, sales is a is service. And don't sell people things that they don't really need just for the sake of your monthly goal, you know. Be in service because we're, we're here to be in service of others. We're not here to be selfish and, you know, we're not here for ourselves. We're, we're here to be in service, to give our gifts away, and if you're really good at what you do, it's because you've been given some gifts and uh, you're not going to give them away, obviously, if it's your uh, career and your business or your products or whatever, but um, figure out what your values, your true values are that depict your behavior and um, and stay in, in integrity with yourself and, and with others. That That's that's the best way to get word of mouth. Yeah. I, I, sometimes it takes a long time. I, I believe in giving yourself away because you'll um giving away the best version of yourself because the money, the people who pay you will come and pay you mm-hmm. if they see that. I, 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 that sounds so counterintuitive, but you know, I spend a lot of time helping people without get, getting compensated mm-hmm. so that the people who do compensate me can compensate me well. That's a question that I asked Chase Hughes, who, you know, is a big human behavior expert at our woman in leadership mastermind um, this week was, um, I tell the, I said to him, I tell my clients this all the time, when people uh, behave badly, it's always from a place of fear or pain. And I said, I, <clears throat> you've got much more experience to the, in human behavior expertise than I have. How do you feel about that? And he said, that's 100% true. Yeah. When people behave badly, he said it's generally through fear. So it's the lack of the sale or the lack of whatever. And if you are in integrity with yourself, why should you be afraid? You know? Yeah. Yeah. That's true. All right. Is there anything that I didn't ask you that you want to talk about? Um, buy my book. <laughs> <laughs> How do we find your book? Let's, let's just talk about your um, book for a minute. Yeah. Uh, Unlock the Magic of Story is um, using neuroscience secrets to influence and persuade any audience. It's on Amazon. Um, fourteen ninety nine on Amazon of the book, but I think you can get a Kindle version of it. Sorry, I don't have Audible yet, but uh, one day you should um, read it yourself because you've got a great voice. Oh no, I, I have to. Um, I read a friend's book recently, and they had produced it like a movie without the, the visuals, and the Audible was amazing. And I'm like, that's what I want to do with my book because I have a lot of stories in it. I've been told it's a fun, fast read with tangible tools and skills. So um, that's that's really nice to hear as feedback. 
Um, and there are a lot of stories in there because I think, uh, it, it, you know, if I'm supposed to be a storytelling expert, I've got to at least show my expertise and exactly. tell some good stories. Well, yeah. and the audio production makes all the difference in the world. There is a, you know, giving away to TMI, there is a sci-fi series mm-hmm. that my husband and I really enjoy listening to. And we listen to it together when we're in the car or we listen to them separately and then we talk about them later. But the reason why we like this series so much is because the narrator is amazeballs, right? Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. if if somebody besides the, the the narrator were to narrate the story, I don't think the story would be as well as good. Mm-hmm. It's all, and, you I, know. and I think I would be doing a disservice to myself if I didn't narrate my book because I'm an expert in storytelling. So yeah. why the hell would I be not telling my stories in my own book? <laughs> yeah. And it, with your voice and your inclinations and your humor and, you know, I can, you, uh, when it's ready, I'm going to listen. <laughs> <laughs> I love, here's, go ahead. Here's, here's another thing for, um, because I've been talking about this so much. If your audience go to my website and download my free downloadable, I will email them another free uh, training about how to depict your values and get into your values and understand more about commanding presence and things like that. It's a seven minute video training and it has a downloadable workbook in it. So, but you can only get that if you go and get the powerful gift first. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Look, listen to that funnel, that, that marketing funnel. I actually, that, <laughs> to me, okay. So the, the folks that work with me regularly know that I prefer to use a marketing colander rather than a marketing funnel because funnels can get clogged and people get stuffed and then sometimes things don't get through. But when you use a colander, the people who don't need to be in your colander get washed away the Ooh. more you drip on them. So if you give away a really good lead magnet, then people are going to stay in your colander and then you wash it, you wash it again, you rinse it again with your second giveaway, which is what you did. So you, so for those of you who have taken that colander training and are listening now, there's an example of a really good colander system. (laughs) And the third giveaway. No, is there a third giveaway? There is actually, you can get a sample of my book. Um, I think it's the intro and the first chapter. You can download that for free off my website too. See, there you go. There you go. Love it. All those things are designed to keep people in the colander, but the folks who don't like them can just rinse themselves away. Mm, Nice. I like that. Uh, Yeah. I need to write that book. (laughs) I need to write that book before somebody else does. (laughs) I love it. All right. This is my favorite part of the interview. It's your moment of gratitude for whom or what are you most grateful? Um, I'm most grateful for my mother um and the support she gave me while she was alive I dedicated my book to her um and I love my men in my life but I'm most grateful for the women around me who are my mentors um the women who support me to be a better woman the women who make me raise my bar um and uh just the women who are there for other women because I you know with us with how things have gone over the last you know year men running the show um it's been hard i think for women to step into women in leadership roles and um i'm truly grateful for the women who've shown me that i can be one of those women too and i can sit at the table too thanks for joining us this week for gratitude geek the relationship marketing podcast helping micropreneurs find your micro influencer magic Make sure to check the show notes at gratitudegeek.com for links to all the groovy resources mentioned today. And while you're there, why not subscribe to the show on Audible, iTunes, Stitcher, or any of your favorite podcast players. Our theme music is track 14 by Rev Brock and Soul Lily. I've been your host, Candice Redardi, reminding you that gratitude is like manure. It's just a pile of poo until you spread it around. Stay <laughs> groovy, my friends. Oh, stay groovy, my friends. <laughs>